Hello, everyone, and welcome to AISC's webinar, What an Engineer Needs to Know About Steel Erection, presented by Curtis Mays. Today is January 19, 2017. My name is Christina Harbour, and I am with AISC's Continuing Education Group. I'll be moderating today's presentation. I want to introduce today's speaker. Curtis Mays is the Director of Pre-Construction and Engineering at LPR Construction in Loveland, Colorado. Curtis has a degree in civil engineering from Texas Tech University and has 36 years of steel erection engineering experience. experience. He's currently on the executive Co committee for the Research Council on Structural Connections, for which he has been a member since 2006. He specializes in complex and long span steel structures and has contributed to the successful completion of dozens of complex steel structures across the USA and Canada. Welcome, Curtis, and I'll let you take it from here. Curtis? I don't think we can hear I'm you. I'm here. Okay. I'm here. just wanted to get my screen switched over to sharing, All right. so I want to make sure that that's working. So good morning and uh, good afternoon to others. I know we're kind of midday here. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me just say that I've spent the last, oh, well, all of my career as a uh, engineer in the steel erection and industrial construction engineering world. And I want to thank AISE for the opportunity to present on this subject. Just imagine if something really went wrong on one of your projects. How would you feel if you were looking at this? Would you feel like you had already done what you could to avoid this? Or would you be thinking you should have done more to clarify the intent of your structure? Uh, this is a uh, Corinthians Arena in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Actually, it was a, a crane accident and a terrible tragedy, but uh, I guess you can rest a little bit easy because it was not really related to a structural failure in the arena. Uh, just wanted to get your attention. But in steel records, you really could your, use your help. The engineer of, help, engineer of record can really, really help a uh, construction team steel director on the job, and we could really use your help sooner rather than later. We're going to cover some of each of the following for steel erection. Um, I could talk a, an hour or a day on each of these uh, items, so it's going to have to be a, a broad brush, cover, cover just a few things on each subject, specifications, safety connections, uh, talk about lateral force resisting systems, and using and sharing them. Just going to start with specifications for steel erection. So what do you need to specify for the steel erector? It's just a really, really helpful document. The AISC Code of Standard Practice has a tremendous amount of information and, and helpful standards that you can rely very heavily on just to clarify uh, your building behavior expectations. The Code of Standard Practice uh, 7.10.1 actually talks about temporary support of structural steel frames. And they're actually including in that a lateral force resisting system and any special conditions that you, you might have. Uh, things that you should put in your drawings. So how do you expect your structure to behave? Is it obvious to you, do you, is it really clear how your structure is going to behave? It's a, if it's really an unusual building, uh, then it may not be very clear and you don't really want to assume that the construction team will, will understand how your building behaves. So what do you need to We'll, we're going to actually talk about that a little bit later, but uh, at this point, uh, one thing that you can really focus on is uh, is also in the Code of Standard Practice 
structural steel frame tolerances. And I'm going to get into a little bit of a, an example of, of where you can actually spend a little effort to help with the constructability of uh, buildings. Um, one thing, the 7.12 in the Code of Standard Practice does say that the accumulation of mill tolerances and fabrication tolerances shall not cause erection tolerances to be exceeded. So I've got a actually stark example of where this could actually become a, a real field issue. We're handling this uh, fairly well in uh, at this particular project I'm about to show you, but it could make a very dramatic effect uh, on the structure if you're not paying attention to uh, tolerances that could accumulate within within your structure. This is a project uh, that we're actually working on right now, a very uh, highly complex uh, roof system that's uh, used, uh, made up of a lot of uh, HSS 8 by 16 or 16 tall by 8 tubes. Uh, a lot of those are rolled into an arc shape and then the infill me members in between them are just a uh, straight section. Well, if you just imagine that particular structure, um, we're looking at as received from the mill, uh, 16 by 8 tubes, they, they come straight and and now you've got to actually force roll those into a, an arch shape. And but the problem is when the force of the rolling can actually change your theoretical shape and actually very dramatically. So you roll this uh, arch in the strong direction and by the time you get finished with this, you've got a 15 and a half inch tall uh, section and it's eight and three eighths inches wide just from the force of this rolling. So this is a, a before and after overlay of before and after rolling to radius and this is actually not exaggerated. It's a very dramatic effect. And so if you think of this in terms of uh, well now I, I want to connect straight tubes into the side of this and accumulate. You saw that photograph multiple days of this happening. Then a theoretical situation might look like this, but after rolling, you've got a three eighths of an inch width uh, variation, and so three eighths of an inch times 20 bays is a, a lot accumulation of, of uh, potential uh, tolerances for for a project. And then after that, you because of the height uh, difference that occurs, you align top of uh, steel for both of those pieces and then you've got a really dramatic mismatch for um, for that particular condition. So what can the engineer of record do in a situation like this? Uh, really I think it's just uh, important to, to recognize this as a possibility and then if you could specify some additional quality control dimensional checks, some intermediate checks, you roll the member, you check the, the, the dimensions of the modified piece and then you can make adjustments to other members that might uh, so that you can end up with a structure that you would really want to uh, be proud of. Uh, we, This particular job, uh, we've got things working out and this is uh, the fabricators fabricating these tubes to these shortened lengths and and we're dealing with these dimensional errors, and so, so uh, we're moving along just fine. Um, another, I'm going to give you two case studies for for clarifying your building behavior expectations. And this is going back to that requirement in the code of standard practice for you to to really specify your intent in that regard. Uh, this is a really good example of a project that we did a few years ago uh, in Gunnison, Colorado. It's an athletic facility. And if you look at this uh, picture over here on the on the right side, there's a shear wall, a really uh, heavy, thick, uh, deep shear wall that, that supports one end of this uh, unusual kind of arch truss structure. But then on the far left side, we just have a, a column. And then it's an arch-shaped uh, so we've got some interesting uh, things that are going to go on with the structure. So uh, on the original structural drawings for this job, though, we had the, the drawings with the shapes and the sizes and and all the specifications for that. But we also had 
uh, notes on the drawings that indicated this column over on the left side and the truck itself was to be detailed so that column was initially in the unloaded condition uh, uh, one inch out of plumb. So we, we put chores underneath the truss and, and uh, the, the detailing and the erection was all just a matter of course that we erected that, that column on the left side an inch out of plumb. The truss was fabricated literally an inch short, connected to the shear wall, and we moved the uh, took the shores out, and then the truss behaved just as designed, and that column went from a one inch out of plumb condition to a plumb condition for the final dead load state. Just a tremendously uh, powerful example of what the engineer of the record can do up front to make sure that. Uh, construction behaves just as you intended. Uh, case study two here is where we dealt with a, a similar situation, but it was uh, nothing was specified. Um, I just uh, want to show you here. This is a, a mill pipe mill rolling facility that we built uh, a few years ago, and it has multiple bays. You can look down at the bottom here. There's actually seven bays in this structure, and they're all crane rail bays. So with crane rail alignment, those uh, the alignment specifications for crane rails are very tight to be able to make those uh, those crane uh, overhead cranes work correctly. Uh, here's a couple of uh, pictures of the of the actual crane rails, and you see the uh, uh, the roof system was kind of this. Uh, pink uh, arch girder system going across the top. And so there's three bays out of actually seven. And as I got into looking at the structural analysis of the stability and loads and all that uh, for the uh, direction forces in the job, I started seeing in the model this horizontal deflection where your, this is your, your unloaded situation here. This is the theoretical shape of the structure, but now you put the dead load into the structure, and the uh, arch-type shape of the roof system had this spreading force that had a tendency to distort the building. So this is actually uh, one of my analysis models when I was uh, early before. This is a couple, three months before we actually started the job of discovering the behavior of this building. And up here, I've got a model, just a single bay erected, and it's really dramatic. We're talking about a horizontal spread of that one column, maybe five-eighths of an inch or three-quarters of an inch here. This is uh, two bays erected right here. The center of column makes sense with the come back to plumb, but, but now I've got uh, Seven eighths, almost an inch of horizontal uh, push uh, because of this arch condition. Imagine what this did to your crane rail, your crane girder alignment. Uh, three bays, it's getting we're up to one inch, and then you do all seven bays, and, and, and theoretically you have maybe an inch and a half spread that's occurring. In the center, all the columns are nice and plumb and spaced just right, but then on the outside, these are supporting the crane girders. Uh, just a really difficult situation. So, you know, the, um, the point is, if you have any kind of unusual behavior uh, happening in your in your structures, then lay that out on your drawing. So, estimate whoever's estimating and bidding and trying to build these projects. Um, uh, we caught this early, but these kinds of things could be uh, caught, you know, Three quarters of the way through the project, and now you're having to deal with with uh, all kinds of rework, or how am I going to fix that, and all those those sorts of things. Back to what do you need to specify? Just consider construction safety. You guys know the most about your structure, how it behaves, especially at the time specifications are released before the construction team is really uh, into the project. Uh, you can certainly. Uh, exclude construction means and methods. It's not your responsibility, but if you can fly potential hazards, you can help the construction team, and that's just a good thing to do. 
I want to talk just a little bit about uh, hurricane contingency plans for construction. Uh, the AISC Code of Standard Practice 7.10.3 clearly indicates that the erector is not to consider loads for unexpected events, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquake, explosion, collision. But hurricanes is, is a, a different category because there is some degree of predictability. Um, Tropical storms are coming in, and, and you might have you know three or four days of advance notice that allows uh, for hurricane provisions could be in place. So ASC 37 does address hurricane provisions, but obviously these wind pressures are you know two two and a half times what the normal storm loads would be for a construction. So LPR believes that. You know, hurricane load planning would be, this has to be considered an extraordinary measure. It should be really clearly addressed in your specifications. In our opinion, uh, first choice is make that a builder's risk in situation. Uh, uh, you know, follow the AISD code, shall not consider hurricane loads. Uh, if you are in a compelling situation with your owner, that you really have to do this, then clearly indicate in the specs, ask for separate pricing to evaluate that price uh, versus the, the risk, because it's uh, very significant. I'm going to talk a little bit about safety for steel erection. Subpart R has a lot of good information uh, about safety, and I'm not going to go through all the, uh, all the OSHA uh, criteria, but there's a few I'm going to point out that actually I've considered some difficult things that are actually potentially pitfalls that can actually cause some, some safety issues. Um, uh, I think it was in 2001, uh, subpart R said you've got to have four anchor rods uh, in, in your design, uh, but then they also say give, give you a kind of a loading criteria for designing those anchor rods. The reason I'm talk, I want to talk so much about column anchorages is because engineering records generally have a lot of bad design work. Uh, it's not delegated so much to the fabricator for connection design and that sort of thing. So I'm going to put a lot of focus on that. So just uh, looking at uh, this, you, you, you can think about these high-functioning iron workers. They can, uh, they can put a load on that column and and uh, that may uh, actually coincide with the load that OSHA is talking about. But look at this guy. He can actually hang it down, upside down off of his knees. I don't know how he does that. But don't forget the wind. You've got to keep in mind the wind. So this is the, the OSHA uh, requirement that's written down in the standards for what the engineer record is responsible to design anchor rods for, put four anchor rods in, and design for 300 uh, pound load. There's an iron worker with his tools hanging 18 inches off the face of the column. So you just do a little bit of math for a 12 inch column and you've got 0.6 kip feet for that uh, overturn moment that, they're, that uh, the OSHA is saying you should design for. Well, don't forget the wind. Uh, this is a 45 mile an hour wind pressure, and how often is it possible, you know, uh, how many times a year do we erect structural steel columns and a storm comes up and, man, that just showed up really fast, all of a sudden we've got these, this level of wind coming through the project, and our column is there and it's anchored. Well, that's a 5.8 feet of overturn moment, and OSHA said, hey, you can design that for 0.6. That's eight times the load. This is a really, really difficult issue, and it's, it's not hard to manage and design for, for that level of, of wind. But uh, just, uh, here's another example uh, looking for 60 mile an hour wind. Uh, we would not normally have to deal with 60 mile an hour winds uh, you know, on a daily basis on a job. Uh, but steel rushers would love to be stable for 60 mile an hour winds just to, you know, get the job done. 
But uh, again, that's 16 times the OSHA requirement. So the point is, things can happen, and it's not difficult for you guys to to do a little design work with your anchorages. And we're going to get more into detail on that later. Uh, we're still in the safety section here, uh, looking at brace connections. Uh, what a your, this is your typical or atypical arrangement where you've got a, a tube type brace that has a, a fillet weld arrangement, and it's very common to have just a single true bolt there. Uh, OSHA says at least one bolt per connection for that detail. Well, that's one that's allowed by OSHA, but if we found that if you can have two bolts two through bolts up here, they're both temporary measures. That makes it so much easier for the erector and so much safer for the erector to actually get that member in place. He uses a sleever bar or a spud wrench for the first hole, and that aligns it, and then he can use the other hole to get that through bolt through. I'm going to talk a little bit about connections for steel erection. I want to just note that the, the connections that I'm showing here uh, they're the reflection of LPR construction preferences, and uh, each fabricator and director has their own preferences and uh, opinions, and so that's going to vary. And so, talk to your local fabricators or the ones that you think uh, may actually be participating in the job uh, to be able to look at their preferences. Just going to start with some basics here. Uh, this is a Teckel model of just some beams and column connections. Um, I'm going to start with the these uh, carrier beams here that we're connecting into the webs of column. From the erector standpoint, this is doable in most cases, but it's it's difficult, especially if you have uh, if you're going into the web of the column on both ends of that piece, um, then that makes it much more difficult to actually enter the column into its location. Um, not it's something we can do, but it, it actually slows things down. Uh, uh, but it can be economical for the fabrication side. So this would be an extended uh, shear plate arrangement, which a uh, steel erector is much more likely to be happy to have on a job site. Uh, obviously, there's a, a significant difference in the fabrication cost for something like this, but especially if you have some con continuity plates that you need to go through for, for beams in this direction, then you already have some stiffener plates in there to deal to help hold your extended shear plate there. Uh, as far as interior beams are concerned, where you're not connecting to columns, uh, double, double angle clip connections are, are just fine, but we're dealing with this through connection where you have to deal with the connection on the opposite side where you're sharing bolts. And that can present some difficulties for installation for the erector, uh, slow some things down. Uh, so we wouldn't call that a preferred uh, condition. Now, if you can get to a sure tab type connection, where it's a single-sided connection, that is a great, very erectable connection. You can put some slots in that member to avoid accumulating link errors on that project. You know, on, on those projects, um, if the fabricator prefers to be a completely uh, bolted shop, then you can go to a these heavier single-sided angle conditions, and then that makes a really nice erectable connection uh, for the project. Uh, I think I already mentioned you could put some slots in here too to avoid some accumulating space in there, and I'm going to talk about that here in a little bit as well. So just simply think about the ease of access in your design. Try to put yourself in the iron worker's shoes there a little bit as you go along. Uh, just a little bit of effort, you can really help us out. And now I'm going to talk about a few example um, column anchorages. Uh, think, keep, in, keep in mind those uh, those wind loads here. I'm, I'm repeatedly going to be recommending. This is not a requirement, but if you can apply 15 pounds per square foot or even 10 pounds per square foot, it would be helpful to the face of the column and look at the reaction. Uh, in this case, uh, this would be our, our preferred uh, erection for freestanding, a short-term freestanding condition where we put a shim pack in the center to get the elevation, and then 
Uh, no shim packs around the outside, just one single shim pack. We put the column down. Now we can rock that column a little bit with these, these anchor rods, get that uh, column plumb and supported and got tied into the structure. That's just a, a terrific uh, arrangement if you can uh, have and, and this is very helpful to have the anchor rods extended outside the footprint of the, the base, the, the column footprint. Uh, you also, try to keep in mind if, if you could just add a, an inch or two to the blade, base plate size, a little, we call it meat behind the workers, call it a little meat between the edge of the hole and the edge of the plate, or uh, distance to the actual column shaft itself. In case something goes wrong, you've got a little bit of room to do some slotting if you have to, uh, to be able to accommodate some uh, anchor rod imperfections. Uh, this is Similar detail, but we were actually would utilize leveling nuts and leveling plates. And in that case, you always want to make sure that you're increasing your valve space so you've got room for a leveling nut, leveling plate, and maybe an inch of uh, space field below that for, for a grout. Uh, this same detail works very well for a shear key arrangement. Uh, if, if we were to have to put shims. If we, if we didn't have leveling nuts, chances are we'd have to put shim packs right on the edge of this opening right here to be able to erect that, and that can really cause a potential problem for spalling, a really safety hazard, uh, putting shim packs right up on the edge of that, that uh, shear key to actually do a temporary support of the column. Uh, so we highly recommend uh, your leveling nuts and leveling plates for a condition with a shear key. If you have to get the anchor rod up inside the footprint of the actual column shaft, that's less preferred because that reaction against those anchor rods goes way up as soon as you do that. Uh, but you can upsize the anchor rods here to be able to handle this in many cases. Um, if you but leveling nuts in that situation, now you've got a reaction arm between the anchor rods rather than center of shim pack to the, the rod itself, and so that can help with stability. Um, same thing applies as far as just these wind loads and these uh, column splice connections. So just want to point out again, uh, this is a Steel Erectors Association uh, document and also National Institute of Steel Detailing. But notice they're pointing out this 300 pounds of eccentric load, you know, vertical load at 18 inches off the column face for the design, which is really grossly inadequate to be able to handle any kind of uh, wind loads for the project. Um, not hard to handle wind loads, but those numbers are just way too small. Uh, here's just a column connection here, um, web only type splice. If you're going to do something like this, you want to make sure uh, that you've got some bearing between the flange. It may be a partial pin condition, but as long as you have some bearing between the upper and lower shaft and a condition like this, chances are you've got a decent amount of stability for that connection. Of course, you can go to double channels in that case too and get the stability that, that you might need to erect. So this is uh, what I call my favorite splice. Uh, this is very, very easy to fabricate, uh, very easy design. Uh, it's really good for erectability. You get all kinds of good stability. Uh, the lower shaft would just be a square cut, and the upper shaft is just a square cut shaft. You've got bearing condition there for erection. Uh, just four plates that are fabricated. Uh, this would be the, the detail of the plate. You have more holes for a larger load, larger plates. But put those on the inside, so where your inside of flange is even if you change column sizes, uh, align, at least for the W12 and W14. And so that gives you moment capacity with slip critical connections. It gives you stability. If nobody has to start cutting, uh, you know, bevels and welding and uh, helps works with the erection aid hole for that column. It's just a really good column splice, and I really don't see this a lot in uh, 
structural drawings. Now, this is just an example of, of what a detailer and a fabricator and erector can work together to actually make more erectable connections in conditions that could be really tough. Uh, this is a four claw, uh, ang four claw angle type connection of a live flange to a gusset plate. And imagine if you already have these these angles already bolted onto the the brace itself. Then if you had any tight clearances for actually getting that in place, then you're probably going to end up taking that ang a couple of those angles completely off of those connections if they're eight by eight by one. So they're really heavy, very difficult to work with. But we can actually just extend uh, these angles, maybe one of the angles another three inches, and have ability to rotate maybe just both just this side of those angles out of position where they're hanging off of that brace as you're erecting it. You actually then bring the brace up to the gusset plate from one side without any sandwich type clearance issues. Rotate these these uh, braces back into place around the uh, gusset plate and get everything bolted up. And, and uh, just minor detail things like that can really help us with uh, productivity and, and especially safety on the job site. I want to talk a little bit about what happens when you have a, just a highly complex project and how you might deal with the connections and bolts on the project. This is Denver Art Museum, which we built well, uh, 10, 12 years ago uh, in Denver. Uh, almost no plumb or vertical columns, uh, just diagonals in every single direction, highly complex structure. Uh, one that would uh, warrant some good information for what the lateral, uh, I talked about that earlier, what's your lateral load case, how does this thing hold itself up kind of thing in your drawing. Uh, but I'm talking more about bolts here. Um, there's one of the connections. You've got things coming in from all different directions and all kinds of variety of connections. Um, so what we ended up doing on this job before, well before it got into the design build uh, which is something that we love to do if we can. Uh, or we got in and decided that we wanted to uh, have these connections designed with oversized holes in all of the plies, flip critical connections, uh, so we didn't have any load reversal issues and that sort of thing. So this uh, this would be uh, over here on the right would be what a fabricator many times wants to do is just put a standard uh, hole in one ply and then put the oversized hole in the other ply. Now you do have adjustability and things don't have to be perfect, which would be really difficult on a, on a project like this. But the problem with that is you see the misalignment of the plates here uh, that you really can't control because you have to use a, a pin to align that hole or stick a bolt in and, and it doesn't hold it. As, well, as soon as you get oversized holes in all the plies, we can give you, we can use larger pins that uh, say 32nd of an inch under the oversized hole diameter, and we can line up the theoretical plate dimension, which then utilizes to the maximum extent the fabricated spacing between members, and and but then you have the ability if something's not correct in one of those really difficult connections, then and you can pull that pen out and you can use all kinds of adjustability, uh, not in, not so much at this case, but at this point you can pull that pen out and then you can use the, the uh, we call it slop, I guess, in the hole uh, for that uh, adjustment that you might really need when you're dealing with something like this. I mean, it's hard to imagine that you even you get oversized holes in the right place for something like this. But this worked very well on this project. Um, this is a, a, a shot of uh, the art museum. I brought my wife to this uh, project, and all proud about what it looked like and everything. Drove up, and she looked up. She says, "Oh my, what happened?" So I want to talk a little bit about uh, slots, slots and connections. Uh, you know, slots are good. They have their their place, but they don't need to be used everywhere in a project. 
if you if you were to put slot, let's say this is a, a row of columns, deemed columns here, a connection, and it's in the mill where the mill tolerance can vary. So you you're probably going to have a little bit of mill tolerance uh, accumulation that occurs along this line here. But you don't want to be able to have to space every single. If you put slots in all of these beams, then all of a sudden the director is having to space everything because the building could grow or shrink on you just uh, you know unbelievably not dealing with with all of the slots. So the point is that. You could space slots just occasionally, maybe every four or five days, just depending on what we think mill tolerances might be and that sort of thing. Uh, and that just makes an optimal condition where you're not making slots everywhere, but we have the ability as we're building a project to make adjustments to get the building back to line. In a case like this where everything is uh, connecting to the webs of columns, where you don't have this accumulation of mill tolerance, then you might not need to put near as many slots in that particular uh, building in that particular direction because there's not as much mill tolerance uh, uh, accumulation that would occur. And then as I uh, talked a little bit uh, uh, earlier, infill, you can put short slots in all your infill beam connections and it avoids uh, uh, accumulation problems of, of tolerance is really beneficial. I want to talk a little bit here about the uh, truss cords. Uh, just one slide here, just talking about when we when we bid and build these these uh, long span truss jobs, uh, the orientation of your top cord member uh, may not make a whole lot of difference once that building is erected. But when we are erecting a 145 foot long truss that weighs 160,000 pounds, got a W 14 by 370 top cord in it, and all the forces work out just fine for for that uh, with your web vertical for your design. But I can't erect it; it just doesn't work. I've got to start putting in guys or temporary supports or something. Well, that same truss, 14 by 370. If you put the web horizontal, then obviously you're increasing your your uh, over R or you're decreasing your tail over R and your section modulus is working in the right direction here so I can have a stable truck. So just try to keep that in, that in mind. You've got exactly the same truss weight, uh, obviously a little bit different connections for things tying into that. Uh, I would highly recommend webs horizontal for top cords of trusses. I want to talk just a little bit about uh, bolt sizes. Um, this is pretty simple. Problem is, you look at this, look at these two bolts. They're to scale. That's an eighth of an inch size difference. Really difficult just at glance to know, hey, that's a one inch bolt and that's, that on the left is a seven eighth inch bolt. And especially if you have oversized holes in your project. Um, you could get your one inch bolt in the oversized hole for the seven eighth inch bolt. Quality control issues really uh, can go up. So try to avoid eighth of an inch size differences and, and uh, go with a quarter inch size difference on your bolts. And then also really try to uh, avoid two grades of bolts to the same diameter. Again, just uh, you know inventory and tracking and where do those bolts go? Do we get them in the right hole? That sort of thing can be easily avoided just by uh, those kind of limitations. Let's we'll talk a little bit about uh, designing field welds. I think primarily if you can just spend a little time being empathetic uh, about the welder, put yourself in his shoes or uh, actually his boots, and then also really try to think in terms of he's wearing this great big bulky thing on his head, you know, to protect his eyes and face from, from these welding processes. And so I mean, this is big stuff and it's really hard to to get nimble and, and uh, on a project when you're having to deal with these kinds of things. I mean, the, the welder initial, initially learns how to weld standing up on in some sort of a shack or whatever, you know, easy, easy location and then the real world sets in and and uh, you're hanging off your 
toes to be able to get something overhead weld on a project. Just try to be empathetic about what um, what the position of the weld is. It's just a really um, a good example. Very simple. Happens on almost every project. Step plate. Okay, here's a, the most common arrangement. I'm just going to weld this bent plate 3 16th an inch, skip weld to a 12 top and bottom here. There's my design. I'm done. Move on. Well, that weld that you got to do from the underneath side, think about it a little bit. How beneficial is that weld on the bottom side for what you're actually trying to accomplish? Plus, it takes two or three times the time for that welder to be able to deal with welding in that position as opposed to standing up here on the on the deck and up here to get that connection done. So if you could just think in terms of, well, can I maximize my overhead, my not not my maximize, minimize my overhead weld, sorry. Uh, maximize my good access weld for the project. Let's do three sixteenths four at twelve on the top side. If that's what you need for a structural design. And then hopefully you don't need anything here on the bottom. Uh, concrete's going to be poured on that. It's going to hold it down. It's going to be just fine. Uh, but if you have to, do just a calc to see what you really need on the bottom side, only if required structurally. This is uh, probably the most common uh, production welding uh, stinger that we use in the field for flex for our weld. Um, so we've got our gloves on, and we've got this big gooseneck here, and this actually helps us uh, get into weld access issues. But we're going to talk a little bit about weld access here. Uh, two things I'd like you, two approaches I'd like you to consider when you're looking at designing your field weld conditions. Uh, one is just look at the the angle, a visible view. If you can see the weld zone at a 45 degree angle. But you really can't there. You can only see 23 degrees there. You can see uh, these examples are all uh, actually kind of similar. But if you could see a 45 degree angle uh, looking at that weld zone, then you actually got a pretty good weldable connection. Um, just imagine trying to, to actually get in here and weld a connection like that. Really difficult. And this obviously you could just see that uh, we can get to that weld to actually do the work. Or the other uh, approach is just look at the dimension. Um, this is a one-inch dimension where we have to have a field weld in an in encumbered uh, zone there, and it just doesn't work. You cannot get, uh, you can't orient your electrode the right angle and push it up the hill to be able to get into that vertical weld as you're running up that particular joint. But you can if you're uh, generally a weld like this. The iron worker should have a weld up this way, just like that. My pointer is going that direction. So we found this four inches clearance for any kind of uh, restricted access. It, it doesn't make it just a slam dunk easy to get in, but we can get keep the quality up, and production is not, it, you know, it's okay to be able to deal with the project in that regard. Uh, really quickly, I just want to show this is a slide where we did a bit of a study, and I think this is pr probably pretty common knowledge about the cost effectiveness of a fill weld size. Um, this is all different fill weld size and the production rate and the cost per hour kind of thing. Just to, so we have a sweet spot of uh, 5 16 inch uh, fill weld size. That gives you your best bang for the buck for for a field that's called the fillet weld. I want to talk a little bit about lateral force resisting systems here for seal erection. Um, don't have any. Well, you saw that Denver Art Museum job. That would be actually a pretty good example of hey, you you want to specify this building and then really clarify what's holding that thing up, what's holding it from wind loads, what's holding it from from lateral loads that are occurring from gravity loads. Uh, I didn't put that, I didn't repeat that slide, but just want to talk a little, about this a little bit. So again, back to 7.10 in the code of standard practice. There's two things you're you're needing to specify and clarify your lateral force resisting system. 
and then any special erection condition. I'm going to talk more mostly just about the lateral uh, resisting system here. So what is it? You've got roof di deck diaphragm that's handling load, or is it concrete deck diaphragm handling your load, or is it formed and poured in place concrete deck? I mean, we had a job not too long ago that there was no metal deck for the job, and all of the lateral uh, diaphragm was coming from the perimeter of the building through these poured in place concrete decks. So installing a big structure that you have to now just wait until the concrete guy comes in and forms up and pours all the deck before you get any stability for your structure at all is a really could be a really difficult uh, situation and it needs to be very clearly uh, documented on the drawings what that uh, issue is. Moment frames, uh, brace frames, horizontal bracing, vertical bracing, fixed or rigid column bases, shear walls, sheetrock. No, I'm kidding. No. I guess you're not going to use sheetrock. Um, so simply just clarify your intended permanent load, lateral load path on your drawings. The more unusual, the more effort you should put into that. And do not assume the erector or the contractor is really going to understand and know what you have in mind, especially if there's any complexity. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, using and sharing BIM for steel erection. So this is, uh, you may have seen, seen this uh, BIM workflow graph before or one that's similar to it. The classic graph that shows the benefits of the BIM workflow. We've got the, the red line that uh, is for the decreasing ability to impact the cost and performance over time. And then you've got your black line here that uh, is for the increasing cost of design changes. Uh, you know, you're almost finished, now you have to change something that costs five times as much. Um, then you've got your, your legacy, I call it legacy blue line here that is just for the drafting centric uh, workflow. And so it's actually a little bit later in the whole time process. And then finally, uh, the, the star of the show here is the BIM workflow to where you, you actually bring this uh, BIM workflow and it pushes things so much earlier into the, to the detailed design and, and before the construction documentation arrangement that that now you're really, really helping to with the cost and performance uh, and avoiding these, these late design changes. So now though, if you can venture to actually move construction planning into that BIM workflow, now you're actually if added even more value to your project, uh, you've really improved the, the cost performance and then you've also reduced the cost of design changes. Uh, drew that wrong. Cost of design changes are way back here and then you actually improve your, your performance just by trying to see if you can push construction planning activities, which are normally right here, Try to push some of that as much as you can into the BIM workflow. And that's where I'm going to show you an example of a project where, where we got really heavily into the BIM workflow of the process and uh, just had tremendous benefits. Um, you guys can probably read this slide uh, a little bit later if you want. Uh, just improve engineer record benefits, improve streamline collaboration with the fabricator and the director. Uh, construction team can really help identify them. It's just amazing. Uh, there's so much benefit that we can have, especially if we share this information early and really, really try to collaborate with it. Uh, we're running close on time, so I'm going to move on here a little bit. So BIM's here to stay. This is an uh, example of a project that we did uh, two or three years ago uh, in, in Florida, a highly complex project that Fabricator shared uh, the Tecla model with us, and then we actually utilized and modeled ourselves cranes and rigging and 
and uh, modules on the ground and all kinds of logistics uh, to be able to, to develop and illustrate our, our uh, direction plan for the project. Um, this is just another shot where we're showing actually some, some rigging points uh, for a particular truck. Uh, we actually modeled uh, the uh, direction connections ourselves in Tecla and then sent those the components back to the fabricator which they just imported into their model to actually uh, finish the, the detailing for some of these connections. Uh, and then on top of that we can actually go in now and, and uh, build a, uh, in the model the bracing and all kinds of logistics that may not be a part of the actual fabrication but actually put that in the, in the construction model for our constructability. There's our shearing, shoring systems and, and uh, braces and, and all those sorts of things. So uh, this is uh, just a kind of final shot of what that, that uh, roof looked like. I'm going to just show a couple of pictures here of the actual super complex uh, structural steel uh, modules that we built and erected on this project. Uh, just amazingly beneficial to be able to push that BIM workflow and push the construction planning into the BIM workflow process. And it just made the whole construction team, engineer record, the general contractor, fabricator, director, everybody look really good on the project. This is a final picture of that. And uh, so we just want to thank you for your help and these iron workers. They want to thank Engineer Records for their help. I mean, that's the biggest smile uh, on the job site right here. And uh, I think he's probably thanking a, a Engineer Record. And I want to thank you guys for, for listening uh, to my presentation here. And uh, I think we're going to do questions here just in a little bit. Uh, at this point, we're going to switch. Okay. Thank you very much, Curtis. And before we get to question and answer, we have a little quiz question um, that all of you can respond to, just to make sure you're paying attention. The question is, slots in beam-to-column connections should be used always and everywhere possible, never, or sparsely to manage accumulating tolerances. You can go ahead and just Pick what you think is the correct answer and hit submit. I'll give everyone a couple seconds to enter their answer. Slots in beam to column connections should be used always and everywhere possible, never or sparsely to manage accumulating tolerances. Okay, let's look at how everyone responded. Curtis, it looks like almost everyone selected C, sparsely, to manage tolerances. Just a couple people answered you know, always, never were possible. Would you like to comment on that? Well, you guys were paying attention. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, answers is, is uh, correct. It looks like we have over 200 uh, people watching too, so I uh, thank you also very much for that. Um, yeah, it's just one of those things that we don't want to make work for the fabricator. We don't want to make work for the erector, but we want to use slots where they're beneficial on the job site. Okay, great. Now let's get to some of our participant questions. Okay, um, first question. Do the time and labor savings gained by using slotted beam to column connections outweigh the extra labor required for slotted holes due to it being a slip critical connection? So the extra cost of pre-installation procedures and surface preparation. Well, that's uh, actually in, in many, many cases that you're only uh, punching short slots, and it's still a bearing connection, so you don't have to deal with the slip critical issues for that. And so we can get a tremendous amount of benefit with punching short slots uh, on, on, on a lot of cases. So that cost is really just almost nothing. You might have just a slightly decreased uh, bearing capacity per bolt in that case. Uh, the, the, uh, 
slot. If, if you have a compelling reason to, to use a slot, um, I really believe that you can almost just say this is, this is something you have to do to be able to, to, to have a constructible building. Um, you could always do some studies and say, well, what if we do this and what if we do that and ask the fabricator and director to give you some rough order of magnitude of cost for those differences. Uh, but it's really difficult to answer that question without looking at, at uh, specifics for the for the individual uh, detail arrangement. And uh, hopefully, I answered your question. Okay, great, thank you. And the next question, um, I'll just take us to slide 69 in case this. Uh, we might need this. Could you expand on the benefits of weld size and cost? Well, um, really, truly, this is just a, a fillet weld size cost, but, but it can actually apply to full pin welds and partial pin welds. Um, um, this particular slide, um, it, the spreadsheet's based upon a 100 kit load, and then just building the, in, inputting the fillet weld size and then giving how many kits per inch does that eighth of an inch fill of weld give you, and then the total linear uh, inches of weld required, and then the number of passes. So if you're doing a 5 16 inch fill of weld, it takes one pass to actually lay that weld down. If you're doing an eighth of an inch weld, guess what? It takes one pass to lay that weld down. So it costs you just about the same uh, to put an eighth of an inch fillet weld down, down than it does five sixteenths. And so that clearly explains what happens in that lower uh, weld size range. So when you go past five sixteenths, all of a sudden you've got two passes. So you see in the slide the number of passes to actually accomplish that fillet weld. So you bump past five sixteenths, all of a sudden you've doubled your number of weld passes. And so you pretty much have doubled the hours that it takes to actually get that weld done. But you're only increasing your capacity of that weld incrementally from 5 16 to 3 eighths of an inch. And then it just goes on and on to larger and larger fillet welds um, and the number of passes that it actually takes to accomplish that weld. Okay, thank you. And the next question. Do you have any recommendations regarding steel deck erection? Actually, one thing I uh, almost put into the presentation, but I didn't, uh, I was running long on time, uh, was to at least do everything that you can to try to avoid a single span deck uh, situation. Uh, single span deck is, is can work fine. Obviously, it's not as good of a, it's not as efficient as multi-span deck. But if you get in a situation where you need to put in a single span deck, that also presents a real safety hazard. Uh, they call a single span deck. The iron workers call a single span deck a widow maker because if that, if, if they just put that piece of funnel deck up there and they step on it and it slips off, then now they're going down in the hole along with the deck too. So. Uh, that's probably uh, uh, the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, deck erection, I would really want to uh, try to avoid uh, welded side laps. I know that gives you your best diaphragm capacity in a roof deck situation, but we would always want to try to use some sort of screws for side laps, uh, even button punching if you can develop uh, sheer uh, diaphragm loads with that. Uh, pins are great. Uh, for connections, uh, fillet welds, I mean, pedal welds are great for, for connections for deck as well. Um, there's just some recommendations. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next question, what's the most common welding procedure used in the shop versus the field? And are there any welding procedures that are not allowable in the shop versus the field? I would say the, the most, uh, both the shop and the field for any kind of more complex, sophisticated job with a lot of welding 
you're, you're using a wire feed type of process. Uh, much more common in the field to use a flux core arc weld process. I showed a, a, one of those uh, weld stingers uh, in the presentation, and that has a core uh, flux inside. And it actually, when you're doing the welding, it, it uh, gives off the gas that shields the molten metal from the oxygen. Uh, in the in the shop, it's much much more common to use a gas metal arc weld process or submerged arc weld process, and uh, that electrode is a bare wire electrode, and it doesn't have the flux built inside of it. Uh, that's much more beneficial in a shop because they, it, especially the gas metal, uh, because um, they have enclosure and they don't have wind that's going to blow away their shielding gases. For the gas metal arc welding. Uh, so those are the, the two primary differences. Uh, we use thick weld for more incidental uh, work in, in the field. Uh, that's not stick weld is not used very much uh, in the in the shop these days. Okay, thank you, Curtis. And I think we have time for one more question. We'll squeeze in. I'm going to take us to slide 24. Uh, this is regarding this this case study uh, here. Would you be able to tell us what became of this? Uh, what they what is? Uh, what, um, could you tell us what happened with this? If there were oh, any well, um, corrections that had to be made? There were a lot of corrections that had to be made. We, we, in effect, we just had to move the crane girders on the column seats, um, you know, displace them from the the resulting position of those columns because there wasn't really anything we could actually do. We could manage to try to get things as close as we could. Uh, we could have potentially started. At, these are laced columns. We could have potentially started with with trying to raise one of the two columns within a laced pair to actually try to do some pre-cambering, uh, if you will, to be able to deal with some of this and consider that possibility. Uh, but ultimately, we ended up just having to go through and modify the crane girder position setting on top of those, uh, those uh, crane support columns, and it, it was a mess. Uh, the, best, the best solution for this would be to never design a mill building like this with an arch rooftop arrangement like that. You want to have a straight piece going across from bay to bay across those roof members to, that would actually hold spacing for a project rather than to uh, mess with your spacing. Okay. Thank you very much, Curtis. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today for questions. For anyone who asked a question that was not answered during the webinar, we'll work with Curtis to respond to you by email.